Hello and welcome back to Everyday Anarchism, the show that finds anarchism, non-domination, cooperation, mutual aid in your everyday life. I am your host, Graham Colbertson. This is another episode in my series on David Graeber's debt. I will be discussing chapter one with the medieval historian, podcaster, television host, and all around extremely online intellectual Eleanor Yanaga. We get into Graeber's book, what it's meant for Eleanor's work, why garden parties are so important, and most importantly, the moral confusion that Graeber identifies in debt, the belief that if you have debt, you have to pay it back, and you are a bad person if you do not pay it back, is actually pretty much the underpinning of the United Kingdom and the concept of Britain, maybe more than anywhere else. It's a fascinating conversation. You'll love it. It's coming up after the music. My guest today is Eleanor Yanaga, if I said that even close to right. Perfect. That was bang on. Yes, yes. And this is um, my my long announced, hopefully long awaited, I've been waiting for it for a long time, series on David Graeber's book, Debt. Obviously, I, I already recorded uh, a first episode, which you will have heard, dear listener, unless you're just here for Eleanor, you'll have heard me talk about chapter one of Graeber's Debt. And here I am to talk to Eleanor Yanaga, medieval historian author, all around interesting, fascinating person and Graeber loving person to oh, talk yes. chapter one, debt, Graeber, everything, garden parties, which I wasn't planning <laughs> on making the center of this, but why the hell not? The garden party must, the story must be told. Well, th this is the thing, right? Because chapter one, <laughs> um, I think is such an interesting one, especially like in a way, I'm kind of like, this is the, you know, Americans in Britain experience, right? And especially if you're, if you are, um, you know, a leftist and an American in Britain, because, you know, this whole thing about, you know, garden parties, right? And <laughs> we're, 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 there, there's the semiotics here that you that is difficult for us to understand as Americans, where all this stuff kind of happens in the UK, specifically at garden parties, right? There's these garden parties every year. And um, so it's like, uh, th there's big ones. Um, like, I guess this is, you know, he goes to this Westminster one, but there's like, um, the Tribune Garden Party and all this stuff. And it gets to kind of the heart of the unique British sickness of, uh, you know, debt and, and capitalism and all of these things. Because here, everything is really so insular up the top because we, you know, we, we, we had our revolution at the wrong time over here, right? It was just like, oh, we wasted our revolution on, 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 Puritans, which is the stupidest thing that you can ever do. Um, I should, I'm going to break in now, Eleanor. Uh, <laughs> my second series that I'm working on concurrently is a seven part series on radicalism in the English Revolution. But uh, carry on, carry on. Yeah, yeah, no. So th this is the thing, right? We kind of we had this wasted revolution and then didn't do it. And so we have all of these really old systems of debt and ownership and all these things that are kind of still ticking over. And they're fed at stuff like garden parties, right? Where at garden parties, you meet like the right sort of people, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, at garden parties, you know, um, you're going to have a lot of the press there. And our press is like this completely insular uh, lapdog group of people who all went to Oxbridge. And they all know each other and they all have like ridiculous names. Right. <laughs> and uh, and, you know, like so we, we and then they, they get together at these garden parties and like pat themselves on the back for having like liberal values, quote unquote. Right. But then uh, don't understand why, you know, third world debt is an issue or why there is kind of a moral responsibility on the part of you know, one of the countries that exported imperialism at the barrel of a gun around the world. Like why why we you know, have a responsibility here uh, because there's this kind of politesse, right, around like who owns what and uh, what people own here is debt. I mean, we're we're a nation that, you know, the biggest dream we can have in the UK is being a landlord, right? And, <laughs> and so it's kind of like, you know, the, the thing that you want to do is be able to kind of like extract money from an underclass constantly and to to bring up something like that as a, as a moral quandary 
fundamentally gets to the heart of that in in this really particularized way. And so it, like when whenever I read chapter one, I'm just like, I can feel it. I can feel it in my bones. You know, like the, this ex- kind of experience of being sort of like um, a very occasionally brought into these spaces. You know, obviously I don't have the reach that Graeber ever had. Um, but, you know, one does uh, sometimes get trotted out as like an amusing oddity, right? <laughs> Have these things about look, look we found an american like it's just, it's just terribly leftist and uh, say, say something eleanor say something to the people you know that this kind of thing uh you know like well i'm more of a historical materialist than graber really but you know, they, 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 and they're gonna they're gonna like all these things uh but so it is this um really familiar kind of coziness with the inability to kind of um, come face to face with morality in these situations where the morality always lies on the side of the debtor, right? And um, that's how our entire society is organized. Um, And granted, I think that's true as well in America, but there in America, I think people are a bit more ruthless about it where here, you know, there's this thing about, about being polite and you're just like politely draining the lifeblood lots of people and you know constantly ensnaring them and things you know um whereas in america i think that there's there's so so much more um kind of screwiness about it where it's like oh yeah well that was your individual responsibility to do the thing and that certainly exists here but there's more of a thing about like oh well you know they would never say screw you they'd be (laughs) like oh well i'm afraid that's just how the world works oh yes well terrible shame you know kind of thing Right, and and that's a that's kind of differentiation point. But uh, yeah, one does like to see the English squirm randomly, don't they? Because <laughs> 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 I mean, because the, this is the other Englishness of it, and the and the the garden partiness of it is, you know, we don't make things in the UK anymore, right? Margaret Thatcher saw to that right like there's nothing that we do so we've got kind of like cultural exports, right? And I, I realize also that, that there's this deep confusion about me having an American accent and saying we, but I've lived here for 15 years. <laughs> for like for all intents and purposes, I am a Londoner at this juncture. Um, unless it suits me to point out that I'm from South Tacoma, in which case I will. <laughs> uh, but uh, the we don't make anything, you know, we have the cultural stuff. So, we, you know, we've got movies and we've got plays and we've got, you know, um, the good BBC, which is kind of like the creative side. Um, and then otherwise we have financial in- instruments. And these are the two things that we do. Um, and so it's really interesting, like, uh, Graber says very early on in the chapter, um, you know, and, and what, something that I've said, I've, I've written in the margins, fuck yes, exactly, um, <laughs> is he points out that, you know, one of the things about debt is that a lender is supposed to accept a certain degree of risk. Mm. And therein lies the crux of this country, right? Because we are at a point where we simply do not accept that. You know, we within capitalism don't accept that there can ever really be any form of risk on an investment at all. Um, And this is a problem that we have, again, with like landlords, for example. So, you know, we've had this whole uh, difficulty here where interest rates have just been put up. um, And so everyone's mortgage has gone up. So what happened is landlords just made their tenants pay that. Right. Because the landlords don't accept that there's any risk in the investment of homes. Right. It's like no, I I cannot possibly have risked an investment. You owe me money. You owe me money. You owe me this imaginary money that you know the interest rates say that you do, and you know, but it doesn't make any sense because again, as he says, if a bank were guaranteed to get its money back plus interest, no matter what it did, the whole system wouldn't work. You know, it's so it's this myth that we put on top of it, and then you go to a garden party and hobnob with all these guys from Canary Wharf. And, you know, you're just supposed to kind of take it as read that um, they will always be fine, right? There's a certain class of debtor who's always going to be fine. Uh, But it's a threat and it's a threat on all of society. And it's one that is kind of unraveling now as like basically the shell of the country is collapsing around us, right? It's just ridiculous. So I think you've just closed a circle for me because if you, I personally, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble for this, don't really have a taste for the uh, 19th century British novel. So that's Dickens <laughs> and Austin and all those people. So they're gonna be murdering me now. I'm a scholar of 19th century American literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wharton over Austin, Melville over Dickens. Fuck those guys. Sorry, go ahead. I, I, I love to hear it, yeah. frankly. <laughs> 
frankly, so I, I think that there's a lot to be said um, in terms of like American literature or I, I like I like the 20th century British novel a lot. Oh, yeah. But like, but, but, yeah. The night. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm a Jane Austen truther. Uh, you can't make me like a bunch of uh, novels about getting married. Sorry. Yeah, like, Jesus, you know, thank you. Like, finally, like, someone. Oh, my God. Uh, and Like, this is not revolutionary, frankly. <laughs> and, like, the only time a woman is allowed to show up is if you're sitting here pining over some rich guy. No. People no, have I, convinced themselves that she is, like, the great satirist of that era. And they are just they're just seeing something that's not there so they can feel good about liking it's the It's not book. satire. It's not satire. It's not. Yeah. She's oh. serious. Well, I had no idea um, how revelatory this was going to be. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Eleanor. We've done the job now. Take that, that Jane Austen. Um, yeah. But I, when when you're reading those books, uh, mm. it's all there's always a sum of money. Which let me tell you, mm -hmm. as an American high school, I had no idea what the fuck they were talking about. Like, oh, mm -hmm. she has. A thousand mm -hmm. pounds per annum. Like, what does that mean? Does she have a thousand pounds? Like, I don't understand. Yeah, what like, is this per annum? Yeah, and and so this is the thing: is it's like this is the ex the amount that she's extracting off of, you know, some poor people somewhere off to the side that you don't you need not think about, or, you know, because or, or indeed enslaved people, enslaved often. people, right? You know, like so so people who are toiling elsewhere, and and then you're also supposed to at the same time understand that the people who only quote unquote have like you know 200 pounds a year or something are the impoverished ones you know like you're supposed to be like oh i hope i hope that they marry well because oh it's, it's it's so terrible that only a few people are enslaved and like paying for her to have harpsichord lessons yeah and what this tells whatever. you and again this is the circle you just closed for me the entire the entire 19th century british novel revolves around interest and involves around people who cannot imagine that there would be any risk on their investment because it's never mentioned like he has mm -hmm. 500 pounds a year, but if something goes wrong, he might have less than that. These numbers are quoted as mm -hmm. absolutely assured in perpetuity. And that's that's a way that debt is not supposed to work. No, it's not. It's not supposed to work. It's, you know, like there might be a risk, you know, like the enslaved people might die. You know, the cotton crop might fail. Um, you know, enough hands will be lost in the mills in Manchester that like there are no more little children to be ground to a paste. You know, all of these things could happen and your investment could go down. But no, um, you know, like one occasionally sees this now in kind of like revisionist literature. Um where you you know i don't know if you've ever heard of i think it's called a fine trade and it's like mm -hmm. a thing about people who are uh, trading enslaved people in bristol and you know it's a, it's a morality tale about how it's that's very bad and everything uh but there is like the one thing that is considered outrageous there is that like a guy uh borrows against a shipment of enslaved people that's going to america that still hasn't come back yet and everyone is like oh one doesn't borrow against a ship at sea <laughs> You know, this whole thing like, okay yeah fair enough but but um, it, it, and it's still and it continues on kind of as well so there's i read um, a really great uh 20th century british novel again which i will go i will go to the map for um the other day called hangover square which is very good one. and I, I recommend that people uh read it I, i've immediately forgotten the author let's look it up um i'm a professional uh it's, it's not a podcast if someone doesn't forget a fact and then start googling it during the podcast that's yes, how you know you're podcasting absolutely. uh so it's uh by patrick hamilton and okay. it's really really great and it's um it is kind of uh, credited as being one of like the first written um accounts of kind of like the experience of schizophrenia and it's very interesting uh but there's a bunch of people who are drunks in that way that people are drunks in like mid 20th century america in the in a way that we could never possibly understand right where they're just like drunk and that's like what they do for their living <laughs> Uh, but one of them has kind of like this sum of money, right? And like, and he's able to kind of like eke it out, like pay to live in the hotel that he's living in and to get drunk every day and like to eat enough and he doesn't have to work. And so there's always this kind of like mysterious sum of money, right? And like occasionally they're like trying to get more, like borrow it off of family members and things, but it's, it is always that, that amount. And where's this, where's it coming from? You know, where's the money coming from? But um, great book uh you know it, uh, a lot about how fascists are are awful <laughs> and drunk in it and I, I recommend it yeah yeah okay yeah mm -hmm. so the, i mean i never would have thought about this i mean first of all i like i i wouldn't have thought about the fact that i didn't know what a garden party was i mean i knew what a garden party was it's a party in a garden but like yeah <laughs> the, so, the, so, the social element of it i get and then also just the 
the the real threat now, if you're if you're thinking about, I mean, Jane, Jane Austen is is perfect. The real threat to those people's lives is that the sum of money that they've got invested somewhere isn't going to have uh, isn't going to have a steady return. And it's so easy to see. I do think in America we are we do think that if someone is a capitalist, it's historically at least likely that's because they're doing something um yeah i don't think this is true like hoover it turns out herbert hoover made all of his money not doing anything just moving yeah. money around i think they're i think the american capitalists were more likely to move money around than than build things than we think of but we still think that there's oil or something lying behind it and the british it's like it's just dead and that's okay like what, what what's our national product it's interest that's yeah, that's what that they're is, up to that is it and that is all that exists anymore right so it's like um you know you know when people say ridiculous things about like what you should do in order to like survive in late stage capitalism and they're like you know the two things people will say are like here you know there's the learn to code thing but then there's also like become a banker and it's yeah. like well you should just be you should just be like servicing financial instruments for rich people and that's what you should do yeah and and it works great as long as there's people with guns making mm -hmm. sure that someone somewhere down the line is a doing the work and b giving you the product of the wealth and that's the that's the moral confusion so i told a story when the episode i recorded you know i was a i was a co confused American teenager who hadn't read Chomsky or Zen and didn't, you mm. know, didn't understand uh, American empire and things seemed fundamentally good. In fact, one of the things that seemed great about America is that we had a commercial empire and the commercial empire comes first. And then we have an army that keeps the world safe for this beautiful thing called mm -hmm. commerce. And it's, it's not that it's the other way around, that the army comes first and then the commerce comes. They're one and the same yep. thing. Commerce and conquest are the same thing. And that was a moral confusion that I, I just did not, I did not understand. And then when I was in, uh, I mean, it was two weeks into my college experience when 9-11 happened, it was mm. just like, why? Why would they do this to us? You know, it must be because they're fundamentalists and evil. I had no no sense of the 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 American imperialist empire that in my name, and I guess I vaguely supported it as much as a 17-year-old who hasn't really thought about it can support it, that it was this this thing. The debt had cleaned up all of the violence. And so I was experiencing mm. the moral confusion that Graeber is experiencing. Or, or rather, yeah, I think is identifying. And I think that's a really good point because also, you know, this. I, I think that one of the things that we also have to come to terms with the fact is that the moral confusion is by design. You know, right? All you need to yeah. do is find out what the Chiquita Banana Company was up to, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and the minute you hear these stories, then it becomes very clear you know, how uh, commerce and militarism are the same thing within America. But there's a reason you don't hear about the Chiquita Banana Company. There's a reason, you know, why, um, you know, you can see the Coca-Cola Corporation is like backing coups. You know, there, there are things that, that are kind of like going on all the time. And we accept that as just and moral because, well, we need to, right? Um, yeah. But you, you, but you also have to. You, you've got to hide it, you know, because if people become aware of it, then all of this house of cards comes tumbling down very quickly. You know, it's um, it is a real tough one. So it, simultaneously, there's a sleight of hand happening on the behalf of all, you know, of the empires who are who have their hand in this pie. Where it's like at the same time, we didn't do anything wrong, but no, you may not see what we did. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, well, if you didn't do anything wrong, then why aren't you why aren't we talking about this? Like, why is it why is it OK um, to, you know, uh, you know, I think that the one that I, I'm always harping on about. So in my I, I teach at the London School of Economics, much as Graeber did. Um, and I am in the Department of International History. On um, the course I teach, one of the last things that I teach every year is about the concept of the age of revolutions. So, you know, the 18th century and the American Revolution, French Revolution, Haitian Revolution. And the thing that I'm trying to get them to come to terms with is how it is not really necessarily a useful term because people will put a stop to it the moment black people do it, yeah. right? And also just pointing out that, and Haiti just finished paying off the debt? 
quote unquote, <laughs> that they owed for being like, oh, no, I'm not going to be enslaved anymore. And now apparently you owe France money for yeah. that. Like in the middle of this whole like liberty, egalité, fraternité nonsense. Like, yeah, for whom? Right. And the, the, the debt that comes along with being violently subjugated, it's not just the violence, right? The violence and the physical violence is certainly there. But putting people into a situation where you know that they are going to be impoverished and indeed starting a system where you know there's going to be kind of strong men up the top or, you know, strong women up the top in the case of Imel de Marcos, let's give her her due, girl boss, real girl boss. Uh, you know, uh, there are, you know, you're, you're setting up a system that's going to perpetuate violence, that's going to keep that debt um, going towards, which of course I, I argue is a form of violence, but then there will be actual violence as well to keep mediating that, right? Yeah, and I mean, look, I'm I'm with Graver uh, that, you know, so many things that get described in the sort of cultural left sphere as as violence are not actually violence. Like he talks about the uh, academics who love to read Foucault and, you know, explain, you know, it's like, no, like so many things that you're describing as violence really suck, but they're not violence. But, you know, poverty is a form of violence. And the mm -hmm. reason why you know it's a form of violence is because if you pick up a piece of bread, someone will hit you with a stick. In other words, yep. the constant imminent threat of violence is violence. We don't have to make up a new way of understanding violence to understand that poverty is violence. There's food. You can't have any. If you mm -hmm. ask for it, they hit you with a stick. That's yep. violence. And we don't need any fancy French structuralism or post-structuralism to come up with that. The system is founded on violence. Exactly. And, you know, that that is what keeps uh, debt working. Right. Because if you you could just kind of like say, well, you know, obviously we are a bunch of Haitian revolutionaries and you can get fucked. Like, <laughs> right, right? you know, like have like have fun with that, that, you know, that that wouldn't work for, you know, the empires. They have to be sure that they are going to get some return on this investment, which, again, is apparently risk free question mark uh, yeah. but, well, that's, if it's if it's not risk free then the manor houses might eventually you know get bulldozed or belong to someone else so it has mm. it has to be risk free it Absolutely. has to be it does it does and so you know otherwise who will write ridiculous novels about what you know <laughs> um so th th these are kind of like the concerns uh you know and i think that See, this is a big, like a big part. I, you know, I, I was raised by, uh, I was raised by socialists, so that helps. You know, so I was ahead of the game. So <laughs> I was, I too was in uni uh, during, um, during nine eleven. Although I was in my second year, but I was uh, like, oh well. Okay, I see why that happened. You know, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. I was very unpopular for like voicing that opinion. Um, you know, but but that's kind of like how it went down. But um, you know, I was in I was a senior in high school when um, you know, again, as I say, uh, in Tacoma when the uh, WTO protests were happening. Yeah. And kind wow. of like learn like being there and like getting shot by the cops when we were like I think maybe fuck the IMF. Yeah. question mark it's like again like this is literal violence literal violence if you show up with a cardboard sign and are like please don't make nigerians pay all this money for no reason you know you as someone in the core of the empire will have violence mediated upon them right and you know having that happen to me at 17 was very instructive you know um and you know only made me listen to anti-flag harder <laughs> uh, frankly uh and and you know it like explains the entire trajectory of my life but um you know this is again it's not imagined it's not something that i have to like come up with an analysis you know i have been shot at by the police for questioning the concept of debt right so it, it's violent and and it's it simply is you know yeah and then the the another version of the moral confusion is you know it's like why did why did you eleanor make us shoot at you why yeah. are you being violent we have this nice system that works so well and there's lots of people in suits and we don't want violence but we have to have them in with guns because you guys keep almost tearing down the system so that puts the violence mm -hmm. on the on the extremists and i mean i'm a big fan of the of the non-violent tradition i'm not i don't come yeah. from the anarchist assassination tradition but i want to be clear that there is violence and it starts the other way around and then mm -hmm. the the system claims you know why why are you guys doing that? why did you guys shoot the czar what did he ever do to you it's like, oh, well, it kind of seems like, like maybe something and maybe it was violent 
Yeah, and it, like th this is an analysis uh, that that I find really interesting. Um, uh, and uh, indeed, you, you know, one of my catchphrases, and I'm sorry, I will continue to go to the match of, uh, about this. Is you know, Robespierre didn't go far enough, right? Like I like, <laughs> I like, I like to think of myself as you know, I, I prefer you know the path of nonviolence, obviously, and I think that it should just be clear that we're organizing our world in such a way that um, people are being hurt for no reason, we're killing the planet, and that this is just a, a nonsense and we should just organically come together in order to fix that. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, sometimes you got to kill a bunch of royals, right? Like, and that's, and that is just, sometimes heads need to roll. And like, frankly, if Robespierre had gone a little bit harder, then maybe we wouldn't have like got into this whole thing with Haiti being punished for winning, right? Yeah, I mean... Uh, I have, I, I mean, it's, I, there's, I have lots to say about this, and maybe, may, maybe we should, or maybe we should not go down this, uh, <laughs> down this road. But I think the clear, the clear thing is, once you say that, once you say, you know, we, it's okay. This situation is so bad that it's okay for us to use that violence in response. It's like, well, look at this extreme person. You guys just love violence. It's like, wait, you're the ones with the army. I don't, you, like, you have guns. You have guns. <laughs> lots right? of them. And what? tanks and nuclear missiles and so and why are, how how did how did this become? Talk about moral confusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love this idea. How did it become? You stand in front of a bunch of tanks and say, "I deplore violent extremism." This doesn't yeah. make any sense. But and, and that's the thing is that and that's the moral confusion of it, right? Is that you are supposed to just not see that, right? Like you know, that's <laughs> you you do, you don't see that. That's the air we breathe, right? The air we breathe is that our states are a violent apparatus that enforces systems of debt right and and that's what they do and so you you're not you're not allowed to see it it's supposed to be like air yeah. right you know it's just supposed to surround you and so if you and if you say what's all this then then you're the problem right you're <laughs> the one making it a problem because you're you're not supposed to point that out right and and we have that um you know, to a greater or lesser extent in, in terms of all sorts of social interactions, I would say, under capitalism, you know, so it's like, um, you know, if, for example, if we see um, our unhoused comrades are in distress and they're kind of like, you know, yelling or something like that, you're supposed to just kind of like ignore that, right? And like not, and ignore that distress, right? And kind of yeah. like go on with your life, right? You, there are all these things that in order to kind of like get through the day, you have to ignore these violent things that are happening all around us. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, so it, it's not as bad here in the UK as it is um, in America, for example, our, our trouble with unhoused friends. Uh, but, you know, here in London, certainly we do have a lot of people who don't have anywhere to live. And um, London is full of completely <laughs> empty luxury apartments that are being used for absolutely nothing but finance. You know, yeah. so it's like someone who lives uh, often overseas, not that there's necessarily like, I don't care if they live here in the UK and they're doing it one way or another, <laughs> but um, people speculate on London property from overseas and um, entire housing developments are built and then they're empty. They're empty. Right. And while people are living on the street. Right. And so that somebody who lives in Singapore can make some more money gambling on this. And the only reason why London property is worth anything in the first place is because of the financial services <laughs> that we offer, because like, otherwise, who cares? Otherwise, who cares? You know, right? Be, why, why do you care about this particular city? You know, like, we were important in the Middle Ages because we exported wool. And now we export debt instruments, right? Like that's, and that's it, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's a form of speculation that you're not allowed to see. Uh, but you you'll be surrounded by the violence but you're not supposed to see it right yeah or if there's or if there's no violence it's because the threat of violence is so all encompassing that mm -hmm. you can know, that you can you literally can't see it and i one of the things i say from time to time is the i don't i don't know how many bodyguards jeff bezos has or bill gates or whatever but it does seem like the moral mm -hmm. confusion has been so effective Mm. That never in history have the wealthiest people been able to walk around with such impunity. I mean, maybe mm. this will maybe this will get us to the Middle Ages, and you and you can tell me. <laughs> but it seems like if I were really, really, really rich in most eras of history, and I was mm. walking around near starving people, I would be nervous. And yeah, it's very need... clear that the 21st century billionaires they're not nervous. They're very confident that no one's going to try and chop their head off. 
and this is one of the big problems with our society is we need a little bit more fear in these guys right yeah, it's like it's like because like, like say what you will about you know 19th century you know millionaires and stuff who are, to be clear are also a bunch of bad guys I want to make that very very clear but there was this kind of like philanthropist streak that would run through them where you know it's like uh you know the carnegies at least built some fucking libraries right um or you know here it's really common there'll be like mill towns mm. right um my uh mother-in-law uh, lives in this mill town called belper up in Derbyshire. And, um, you know, it was kind of built for the mill, but then the guy who ran the mill and everything built houses for everyone to work, to live in. And he built, you know, schools and things. And, you know, I'm not saying like company towns are a good thing, but yeah. Jesus Christ, at least you got a place to live out of it. And now you don't get anything. Now, you know, we've got like Uber drivers living in their car, which they own because yeah. they've assumed all the debt. Yeah. But the company, it's the profit. And, you know, so we we are so far removed from even the understanding, like, you know, at least under Fordism, right? You know, Henry Ford understood that his workers needed to be able to buy cars, right? Whereas now there is no understanding of that at all whatsoever. It's just kind of like, well, I'll keep selling debts about um, or I'll allow people to gamble on my theoretical company. <laughs> and then that's that's the actual thing. And that and that's how I'm going to make my money. So it doesn't matter if my workers don't have a home. Right. Yeah. And they should be frightened, but damn, but cultural hegemony is hard to fight against. Yeah. You know? I think I think this is a great point. I mean, say what you will about paternalism, and I could not really be more against that industrial paternalism, but at least it, it was somehow a coherent philosophy that was like, you will do work, I will take all that money, I will take most of that money for myself, and then I will give you enough that you can live like that was a bargain and it was a shitty bargain for the mm -hmm. worker, but mm -hmm. compared to the current bargain, which is like, you will do work until you starve and die and you will thank me for it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't what's I, I, yeah, cultural. I, I'm sorry. I'm spluttering. I'm spluttering. It's, well, that's because it makes no goddamn sense. Right. <laughs> like there, there's, there's no, there's no cultural um, agreement here on what this is, you know, where people, there's kind of this lip service, you know, about like what, you know, employers owing, oh, but you know, they don't even have to pay tax anymore. Like it's bonkers. I mean, like, they, you know, it's like, I mean, not that they paid a whole lot then, but it's still, there was a little bit of like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. Here's your taxes. Right. Like there, there isn't even that. So they operate, you know, co corporations at this juncture operate as this arm of the empires. Right. But they don't, really give anything back to the empires that do the violence for them in order to allow them to do that right so it's like you know there are plenty of financial services companies or what have you here in the uk but they do fuck all for us you know they don't pay tax and they don't do you know they you know all and and basically indeed like the rest of the uk could just like wither off and die as far as they're concerned it's just london or nothing you know uh which is handy for me because i live here <laughs> you know what else should we talk about? We got what about twenty more minutes? Is there anything you want to make sure we cover? Um, yeah, let's see. I'm just like looking through what my uh, my um. Oh yeah, we could talk about the sin of this. Oh right? yeah. So like one of the things that that Graber's amazing at talking about is kind of like the idea of like usury, right? And like and let me be clear, I am not praising medieval people <laughs> like in this uh, in this uh, way because um. You know, obviously, what ends up happening as a result of their conception of, you know, dead money making money as a form of sin uh, is a lot of anti-Semitism. But at least they're acknowledging that it's fucked up, right? Or, or like, you know, the Islamic world where it's sort of like, oh, yeah, but this is between you and another person. There isn't going to be someone who... You, you know, like you, you are taking a, a risk and, you know, it's your name as a merchant. That is the issue. That's that's the thing that's on the line. Right. Um, but it's so important to medieval people's understanding of the world that like it is bad, like it is bad to lend money and expect money to back that you and you will end up in hell. Right. Like you are going to end up in one of the nine circles of hell, according to Dante on this one, if you are lending money at an interest rate and it's used also because it's understood to be so bad, you know, they then force Jewish people to lend money so that then they can justify violence against them. Yeah. Right. Because like, that's how what you force them to do it and then go, yeah, but they're doing this completely immoral thing, which is making money off of debt. Just don't pay attention to why they're doing that. Right. But it, 
it, because it is so violent in order to to reap money in this way that you can be you can be forgiven for then doing violence as a result of it right so there is this thing at least in a more in the medieval society that is acknowledging like i guess the unnaturalness of debt in this way like the uh, which i think is a really interesting concept that they have where it's like well it's not natural like that the the, the concept of of uh cash being dead right um and we don't right for for us we're like no the most natural thing in the world is interest right yeah. the most nat the most natural thing in the world is your thousand pounds a year and and you'll be you'll be at the the cotillion won't you <laughs> and and that's what's that it, it's natural to kind of like oppress people in this manner and it takes so many hundreds of years in order to come to that and in, incidentally this is kind of why i think also the renaissance is such a bunch of bullshit because it's like such a it's such an incredible uh, job that a bunch of people did of justifying reifying a bunch of bankers yeah right like so like oh like the the medici are fine now are they like this is a terrible bunch of people who make all of their money through extortion and they're like oh yeah but they bought a statue one time fuck your statue right like how many necks got stepped on, right? And like, and why, why is the, why is it so much better that like you can have a statue of Hercules because now it's completely acceptable to fleece your common man, right? Like, that, 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 what does this do for the? How is that a better quality of life, right? Like, how is this quality of life improving? Like, oh, a couple of rich people have real fancy frescoes, do they? Wow, real improvement over the medieval world. Fuck off, no. No. Yeah, this this is something we'll definitely get into when when we talk the Middle Ages. Is I've I've become increasingly I mean, when I was an undergrad and you know reading Shakespeare and then trying oh my God to slog through Chaucer, mm. I was you know I accepted yeah the Renaissance was great and the Middle Ages was terrible but and uh, I, I've I've definitely switched my view. I don't I don't <laughs> want uh, uh, this is partially William Morris's fault. I don't want to suggest. I mean, I was talking to some a, a neighbor about like how much I liked Athenian democracy because it was so participatory. And mm -hmm. she was like, well, yeah, but I mean, they were so misogynist and they had slaves and everything. And that just sort of befuddled me because I was just like, well, yeah, but I mean, that's like that's like also today and ever, like it's not like yeah. the Middle ages where some like anarcho-communist paradise i don't want to suggest that yeah oh no 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 not at but all but in so many ways they were i mean it was different and mm. in so many ways better i mean in so many mm. ways the middle ages were were better at least in and and graver suggests this in uh mm. in debt and you know kropotkin suggests this and the historian ian forrest is does not suggest that Kropotkin is right, but mm. I don't know. I'm not an expert, but it does seem like the Middle Ages. So many of the things that we take for granted, they didn't take for granted, and yeah. some, some of them were some of them were better. I mean, I was just listening to an episode of the podcast Byzantium and Friends, oh. and the uh, historian I'm blanking on her name right now. Maybe I can put it in the show notes. Was talking about the fall of the Roman Empire in Britain, and she was like, you know, they stopped being able to have stew because they didn't have anyone who could make the pots, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they had way more calories. We can look at their skeletons and because the, the average people weren't supporting the Roman emperors anymore. And yes, from a like top down, oh, look, the art is gone sort of way. Mm -hmm. It seemed like a downfall, but it must have been actually liberating to enter mm -hmm. the Dark Ages since mm -hmm. you weren't responsible for feeding all those soldiers anymore. Yeah, and, and this is a really interesting thing. You know, I was, uh, I kind of gently pointed this out to, I suppose, a prospective comrade online, although I don't know. I don't know. Like, he, my, my, my man was describing himself as a Marxist, but saying some silly things, I thought. <laughs> uh, kind of about, uh, again, about, about the Dark Ages, quote unquote. Yeah. And he's like, oh, no, but it, there certainly there was a degradation. And, you know, I don't think that it's useful uh, for us to just accept the framing that a violent enslaving empire <laughs> is necessarily better because you sort of like the art that rich people had, yeah. Yeah. right? Um, and indeed, you know, the things that last are the things that rich people had, right? So it's like, yeah, the, you know, the, uh, hey, do I think the Coliseum is a beautiful building? <laughs> yes, I do. Do I think it's cool to force people to kill each other and wild animals in it? No. Like, I think that's bad. And yeah, I like the frescoes inside people's palazzos. How many slaves do you think it took to make that? You know, um, under the Roman Empire, 40% of the Italian peninsula were enslaved, right? And so where what, what does their house look like? 
what art are they enjoying? You know, like, oh, oh were they really able to kind of um, to, to participate in art in this way? And, you know, it elides all that, our understanding of history. And there's a reason why it's presented in this manner. It's because we have to make, you know, the, the, the people who are making money off debt into um, – the winner like like they're their winner they're a winner for a moral reason the moral it's like winners, they, exactly. yeah like it has to be well you know the the roman empire is better why because an amphora came from tunisia what okay so it's like, and, and again these are all commercial things these are all commercial arguments that people will give you is that the roman empire is, is definitively a good because you have professional um, amphora that are coming from across the mediterranean into europe all, all right. So America is, is fine and dandy to keep doing everything that it does because Levi's, <laughs> right? Like that, that it, it's the same argument. It's exactly the same argument. Um, but people don't really understand that, right? And it's like, so how are we, how are we measuring quality of life? And fundamentally, it is not, I think, a moral position to say that access to consumer goods is an all around human benefit, right? Because who can access those consumer goods? Who are the consumers, right? Because like, yeah, you might be able to, I might be able to enjoy them in London, but who the fuck is making them in Sri Lanka, right? So, um, you know, were this all to fall over tomorrow, yeah, certainly things uh, would be more difficult for me, but they might be better for the, you know, the people of South most Sudan, yeah. right? And and I am not most people, right? And this yeah. is this is the trouble is the way that we talk about history and the way that we talk about debt encourages us to see the wealthy who own all of the debt um, as everybody and as the good guys, right? And they're not everybody, you know, like every single fucking Jane Austen novel is encouraging you to say that everyone has this theoretical thousand pounds, right? And that's what a normal person is. Yeah. yeah so this, okay, good. I got it now. So this, and you know, Nietzsche is going to come up a lot more in this book, but this mm. is, we, we have to talk about, I mean, with what you're talking about, what Nietzsche says is essentially debt is guilt. It is a, it is a moral mm. story. And if you don't understand that money is morality and morality is money, you cannot understand the world around you. And Nietzsche, Nietzsche doesn't do with it what Graeber does with it, but that, yeah. that insight in some ways is one of the most important insights in the history of philosophy that Nietzsche is like, how have you guys missed that? And so one way to understand this book is a, a, a true deep, explanation of the project that Nietzsche gets started, the project of the history of money and the history of morality, mm, and to mm. show that we have it basically exactly backwards. We think the people who are using violence or the threat of violence to obtain wealth via debt are the good guys. Yeah. And how we have allowed that to happen, how, I mean, this is why this book blew up because it's so obvious and sure, mm -hmm. probably anyone could have figured it out if they read enough Adam Smith and Nietzsche and Keynes, uh, but I never yeah. saw anyone, I never saw anyone put it together mm -hmm. before Graeber did. And if I had gone to grad school 10 years later, I mean, I was basically done with my dissertation when this book came out and I don't think I read it right away. Mm -hmm. Who knows? This, this was a close, for those of you out there who are graduate students or undergrads, this road of analysis is open to you now. Oh, and I don't man. know about you, Eleanor, but it was closed oh, to yeah. me. Yeah, it took a while even. Uh, so one of the things that I think kind of happened here is it really opened up avenues even within medieval studies to kind of uh, start talking about usury more more often where you know it was always there and it was i think certainly brought up especially in context of anti-semitism if that's what we're talking about but then we would usually you know and quite understandably uh get side sidetracked talking about you know just anti-semitism in and of itself which is a very good and important thing to talk about to be clear uh it's a very it's bad and important thing to talk yeah, about yeah yeah, like yeah, yeah 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 yes it's a bad and important thing to talk about um <laughs> but it, it we oftentimes unless you were doing expressly financial history right and it's like oh my god baby i'm not doing economic oh, history yes. right like i'm not one of those nerds god bless y'all out there but it's not you it couldn't be your girl your girl's a social historian right but so what it did is it opened up an avenue for people like me who do social history to say oh yeah 
well, what is going on in the background here? You know, what are the material conditions and what are the moral understandings surrounding it? And I think that really this is is quite responsible for cracking that wide open as a new uh, frame of thinking about it. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's been a, a real boon to us all, I would say. You know, anthropologists should be working with historians and vice versa. This is what we need from each other. <laughs> it's supposed to be symbiotic. Yeah, and uh, it's it's hard to overstate how much the economists have colonized oh, God. everything. Everything. Oh. And I and I don't just mean everything in the entire world, of course, but academic fields. One of one of my buddies posted a chart from I don't I don't remember what year this was, but it was like percentage of like social experts quoted in a New York Times article. And if you go back far enough, it's a mixture of, you know, historians, anthropologists, psychologists, et cetera, and basically no economists. And as you go through time, it becomes almost exclusively economists. Like if the New York Times wants someone to speak about, you know, what life is like in rural India, they ask an economist. That's just the uh, that's just the default assumption now that those are the people who know what's going on. And not only do they not know what's going on, actually everything that they think and do is just Wrong. nonsense. Yeah, yeah, because um, economics is made up and not oh, real. One hundred percent. I guess I just segued by accident. Um, that's what that's what chapter two is about. So if you're yeah. listening to this pretty soon, there's going to be the the next couple of episodes, which is about how economics just some guy named Adam Smith had this idea and he made something up and actually he kind of stole it from someone and he just mm -hmm. told a silly story. And now our society is run on the basis of one man's fantasy. It would be like if like the Lord of the Rings was the source of everything in civilization. It's just made up. It would be preferable, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just imagine if we just picked another book, right? Yeah. Like, why, so, why? Much, so many nicer fantasies out there. Oh God, you know, and 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 that really is the thing, and it's something that I'm constantly frustrated by, and you know, something that so this is a thing that we're being stymied by currently in in the UK again, not to keep harping on about the dread country in which I live, uh, but um, our opposition, lol. You know, we don't, you, you, you know, you're, you're like, it's the same thing as like in America where it's all like, oh, well, how are we going to service capital? It's like, are you going to like have capital with like outright racism or are you going to pretend that you're not doing racism? Like with the capital, those are, those are the things. But they were trying to pretend for a minute that they were going to, if they got into power, one of the things that they were going to do was like a big kind of like green, and not like a green new deal because we didn't have the new deal here, but they were going to like put a bunch of investing into like green infrastructure in order to drag us out of this hole. Um, and now they've come back and said that the economic reality <laughs> means that that can't be done. And I'm like, there's no such thing as economic reality. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. And so it's like there was, they were like saying that they were going to give us all universal child care and that there was going to be this thing, you know, and, you know, maybe save the NHS question mark. But no, there's no money for it. There's no money for it. What do you mean there's no money for it? Money isn't real. Money, money is not it. real. Yeah, I, I, mm. Yeah, I mean, there we go. I mean, again, this is just, this is this is what's coming. This is what's coming next. Money, money is just someone's idea. And so, whenever, whenever you ask for good things from the government, it's different if you ask for good things from you know someone who lives near you or your mom and dad or something. If there's a government that makes up its own money and you say, hey, can we have doctors? Look, maybe there's not enough resources to provide doctors. I'm not your government. You'll have to ask your government about that. But if they say, no, there's not enough money for it, that's not true because the government makes up the money. It's like you, this is these are decisions that you're making. And and like similarly, I think economists went on this big tour. You know, this is this is worldwide. Like I and I think they're still doing it. They're still playing the hits, you know, with the interest rates kind of going up all over. <laughs> uh, and they said, Oh yeah, well. Um, the reason why inflation is happening oh, good, is good. you people, <laughs> you people asked for more money, like in your salaries. And um, it made the it made the line sad and the mm. line got really sad and it started to go down. Uh, and so now money isn't worth as much anymore. And it's like, well, in the first place, no one's been getting a ra like which raises were being given out because that I'm 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 startled to hear that we're making more money. And in the second place, could it not be that like companies are demanding to always make a bunch more profit and like companies can only make profit 
and they can't, you know, this is, you know, one of the big problems with, you know, uh, public companies is they have these things written into them that they that their investors have to make money every year. They're like, what do you mean? You can't invest in something and be like, but I'm go always going to make money every year. Right. It's like, no, no, no. You're assuming risk. You're assuming risk. And they don't care who has to be, you know, killed as a result of it. You know, like groceries here have you know, doubled in price. It's absolutely ridiculous in order to just buy food now. And the grocery stores are raking in profit. They're all, they're all like massively in the black, like, and they're all, they're all boasting about record profit. So explain to me why all the grocery prices had to go up, right? They did it. They just saw an opportunity. And then, but then again, the moral liability is shifted onto the debtors, right? The moral liability is shifted onto the people who are like, well, I can't afford bread now. And it's like, well, that's because you shouldn't, you asked for more money. And that's why you, <laughs> this is your fault. It's your fault. And it's like, what, it doesn't make any sense, but you know, it's a form of economic discipline, right? And it's a form, it's a form of violent coercion, essentially. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is where we started and this is where we will end because this is, this is the reality we are living in. The mm. people who are raking in all of the money are claiming that this is something called, you know, capitalism, which involves risk. But, you know, the capitalists do not accept any risk, whatever it is. If it's if it's capitalism, it's not the one it's not the mm -hmm. one where people with money risk it. The logic of <laughs> capitalism as it exists is that if you have money, more money keeps coming to you. And for some goddamn reason, that's because you are good and there mm -hmm. is no violence in the system except for the violence, A, done by those anarchist terrorists or, or Marcel Marxist terrorists, but this is an anarchist show, so that's my focus. And we or love B, it. <laughs> yeah, B, the violence that sadly, tragically must be done by the powers that be to mm -hmm. preserve this beautiful system that has brought us peace and prosperity. That's mm -hmm. what the story of, of debt is about. And Graeber nailed it. Absolutely. You know, the, you know, one of the best to ever do it. And, you know, one of the reasons why I think it's so important to keep talking about this, because um, we can't let it just be a one man Right. Because he's such a singular talent here and was mm. so good at identifying this that I think it, it behooves all of us, you know, on the left to really see ourselves as indebted to his work. You know, we have to pick it up and run with it because it can't stop with him. We have the message must be told. You know? yeah. I mean, yeah, he got the word out. I don't mm. see that much has changed. It's up to us to change it. Mm hmm. Thank you so much, Eleanor. This was such an absolute pleasure. And I, I will see you back next year for our discussion of, uh, of the, the chapter on the Middle Ages. I cannot wait. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks again to Eleanor. Now you know what a garden party is, don't you? <laughs> we all learned that together. Next up is my discussion of chapter two, the myth of barter. We're going back to the old against economics well. God, is the field of economics so diluted. And when you read them <laughs> defend themselves against Graeber, it is laughable. I am talking to a couple of economists to come on the show, and, and I do believe there are smart and interesting heterodox economists out there, like Dirk Entz, who I had on earlier, but the mainstream neoliberal ones, and that's left and right neoliberal economists, they do not get it. And Graeber savages them in chapter two of Debt. I hope you're looking forward to it. I certainly am. <laughs>